Good morning, church. We'll read from Psalms 146, beginning in verse 1 for David's lessons this morning. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes and human beings who cannot save. When their spirits depart, they return to the ground. On the very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those who help is excuse me, blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose help is the Lord of their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Brother David. Thank you, David. You may be seated. So, Ed, I appreciate your flexibility. Uh, that uh, mistake or typo in the bulletin is, is my mistake and typo, but I appreciate the way you're able to be flexible and uh, how it fits so well with, with the service. Uh, thank you. And thank you for last night, you and Jeannie as well. That was a lot of fun. Uh, we saw the movie here, had at least four visitors. Maybe there was uh, one or two others, but uh, great time together. Look forward to next month to see another movie together. So one day during the presidential transition, the lame duck president met with his successor in the Oval Office. And near the end of their orientation time, the outgoing president presented the incoming president with three numbered envelopes. And he gave him instructions, when you run into some trouble, I want you to open each envelope uh, according to the number. Start with number one and go through number three as you encounter trouble. So after that new president completed his honeymoon period with the press and with the public and all that, he ran into his first problem, an economic downturn. So he opened the first envelope and he took out a card that was in it and the card said, blame me. And so the new president proceeded to blame the old president for the problems and, and everything settled down. Well, after a little while, there was social upheaval, which brought about a critical domestic crisis. So the new president opened the second envelope, and he pulled out a little card, and the card said, blame my party. And so he did. He, in an overt display of partisan politics, he blamed the other party. And again, things settled down. About a year later, his foreign policy resulted in some serious problems, so that new president opened the third envelope, pulled out the card, and the card said, prepare three envelopes. <laughs> Thankfully, the 2016 presidential election and inauguration are over. And in what very few could ever have imagined, Donald Trump has become president of the United States. And no matter what our differences, politically or otherwise, surely we can all agree that this campaign has been one of the most demoralizing and even traumatizing for most of the country. But unfortunately, the great divide in our country and the hostile feelings and reactions that swirled around this election have not subsided. Since the inauguration and some of the new administration's uh, appointees to the cabinet and first policy changes. There have been protests, there have been violence. Feels a little bit like the world has gone crazy, right? For several weeks now, I've felt compelled to try to bring a message of wisdom and peace for our congregation in the midst of this chaos and unrest that is around us. As you know, I don't like to talk about politics. And actually, this sermon is not about politics. This sermon is about how we as Christians should conduct ourselves in the midst of a fractured nation. So initially, I thought of this sermon as, as a break in the Transforming Truths series that I've been presenting. But then I realized 
This isn't a break in the series. This is another truth that needs to be added to the series. Today's transforming truth is the fact that we can be good citizens and that ultimately God requires that we strive to be good citizens. What I hope to do in today's sermon is to give us some perspective on God's principles for citizenship and to help us apply them to our present situation and always. So the first thing that I want to emphasize is a truth that I point to any time I discuss politics and elections, and that truth is that God is in control. God is in control. When Jesus' life was in the hands of Pilate, he made that important point to Pilate, didn't he? Pilate said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Don't you realize I have power to either free you or crucify you? And Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Guess who's in control? Psalm 22 and 28 says, for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nation. Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. What a blessing it is to know that no matter who is president, God is in control. And God is working out all things for his purposes. So what then are we to make of the fact that Donald Trump is now the president of the United States of America? And what purposes does God have for a Donald Trump presidency? And my honest answer is, I don't know. As the political pundits weigh in on the many sociological and ideological factors that contributed to Trump's stunning victory, we must keep in mind the spiritual side of things. As I said, God is in control. He sets up kings. He deposes them. Therefore, Trump is president because God has allowed it. And so if God has raised up Trump for certain divine purposes, we might wonder what those purposes are. Now, to be sure, some will say, yes, God has raised up Donald Trump, but it is to judge America, not bless America. He has given us what we deserve, and it is not good. Now, certainly God did that when Israel clamored for a king, right? God tried to warn them against it, but they wouldn't listen. And so he gave them what they wanted. And Saul became the first king of Israel. Now Saul proved to be a less than ideal king, didn't he? But there are certainly many other purposes that God may have for a Trump presidency. And we will just have to wait and see what, material, what materializes. I hope God's purposes for the Trump presidency are to bless America and for our prosperity and not for our punishment. But we shall see. Now, I read some interesting things about uh, uh, what others might think about this. I read something interesting by a minister named Jeremiah Johnson about the sense that he had for what God might do through a Trump presidency. Now, he wrote these things back in July before this ever materialized, but, but it's interesting. He said, this is what he sensed God was telling him. Trump shall become my trumpet to the American people, for he possesses qualities that are even hard to find in my people these days. Trump does not fear man, nor will he allow deception and lies to go unnoticed. I'm going to use him to expose darkness and perversion in America like never before, but you must understand he is like a bull in a china closet. Many will want to throw him away because he'll disturb their sense of peace and tranquility, but you must listen through the blundering and blantering to discover the truth that I will speak through him. Also, another perspective by Dr. Lance Walnow, a Christian speaker and leadership coach who sometimes thinks outside the box. Walnow believes God is using Trump as a wrecking ball 
to the spirit of political correctness. His emergence is such a destabilizing threat to the vast deal-making machinery embedded in both parties that he has the unique distinction of being rejected by both liberal Democrats and establishment Republicans at the same time. I find those very interesting perspectives. But I say again, I don't know what God is going to do. And I don't know how God might use a Donald Trump presidency. What I do know is that God is in control and that God's purposes cannot be hindered. Now allow me to speak to those who may be very unhappy or very worried about a Donald Trump president. You know, there have been seven different presidents in my adult life. Some of you are older than me, so you would add a few more to those. But during my adult life, when I've been paying attention to what's going on in the world, there have been seven different presidents. And about half of that time, the president has not been the one that I wanted. I thought the world was coming to an end when Bill Clinton was elected president. I could not believe that the American people wanted a man of such poor moral character in the White House. I was truly scared about what would happen to our country with him at the top. But we survived. We survived the Clinton presidency and all the other presidents we've had because our country is bigger and stronger than any one person at the top. But even though half of the presidents weren't the ones I wanted, I have never had an attitude of, not my president. I've never wanted any U.S. president to fail. Because if our president fails, our nation fails. And we citizens are hurt by it. I like this cartoon. It shows a hole in the boat with People at one end saying, sure glad the hole isn't in our end. <laughs> well, if that hole causes the boat to sink, it doesn't matter whose end the hole is in, does it? And the same is true with our country. We only have one president at a time, and he's the president of all of us. And if the country does well, then we're blessed. But if he sinks, then we all sink. So what are some do's and don'ts for us as Christians that will help us to be good citizens? First and foremost, we as Christian citizens must obey the law. And, and something that helps me to have a spiritual perspective about citizenship is to realize that Christianity has been around for a long time. And Christians have lived in every country of the world. They've had to live out their Christianity under all types of kings and governments, what we're facing is not new. It's been going on for 2,000 years. But God's command for us Christians since the beginning of Christianity is to strive to be law-abiding citizens in whatever country we live in and whatever governmental system we live under. To the Christians living there in Rome, look at what Paul wrote to them. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have existed by, have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. And then to the Christians scattered about the Roman Empire, the Apostle Peter wrote, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right, for it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of Foolish men, live as free men, but do not use your freedom to cover up for evil. Live as servants of God. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. 
I take a look at this list of Roman emperors who, uh, who were in power during the early church. So you look there and you say, all right, uh, Jesus was alive under Augustus, and Tiberius, and the early church began under Tiberius, and then Caligula, and Claudius, and Nero, and then Vespasian, and Titus, and Domitian, who was one of the worst. Those were some brutal, unethical, self-centered, delusional dictators, and yet both Paul and Peter say they were in power because of God's establishment, and they must be submitted to. The only time God's people are not to submit to governing authorities is when those authorities command us to do something that violates God's commands. And we see that in the Bible sometimes, like when the king that Daniel served under said that no one could pray to any god except to him. Daniel disobeyed that order. Daniel kept praying. And then there was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the, the king who told them they had to worship an idol. They disobeyed the king and obeyed God. And then those apostles were told to no longer preach about Jesus, and they said, judge for yourselves whether it's right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. But unless obeying the government would cause us to disobey God's commands, we must submit to the governing authorities and live according to the laws of the country we live in. We're good citizens when we submit to those in authority and obey the law. We're called upon by God to do so no matter who is the president, Nero or Domitian or anybody else. Second, as Christian citizens, we can pray. And the Bible says the prayer of the righteous person is powerful and effective. And Paul wrote to Timothy, he gave him this command. I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority. And concerning the nation of Israel, God said, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. And I believe God will do the same for any country, not just Israel. Any country that will pray and seek God's face and humble themselves and purify themselves, God's going to respond to a nation that prays like that. Now, many of us have deep differences with our president, and we would have no matter which candidate had been elected. But we must pray that our president will succeed in leading our country with wisdom and justice. Let's pray for all our elected officials. Let's pray they will humbly look to God for direction, that they will not pursue party, nor personal goals, but we'll do what's best for the citizens of our country. We can pray. Number three, as Christian citizens, we should not argue, complain, judge, or condemn. Paul wrote to the Philippians, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. We're not supposed to be like everybody else. We're supposed to be stars shining in the universe. Interaction on social media, face-to-face -face conversation has gotten so negative and combative, but it should not be this way for Christians. We must avoid complaining and arguing and being condemning about people and policies. We must be very careful about how we represent ourselves and Christ as we interact with others. And if we need to enter into the arena of ideas to try to change people's thinking, we must follow God's guidelines. And look at what Paul wrote to Timothy about this. The Lord's servant must not quarrel 
Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Now, certainly, we can exercise our rights as citizens. We can contact our elected representatives, and we can let them know about our ideas and wishes for the country, and we must do so with respect and dignified communication. But Facebook and Twitter are probably not the best places to try to enter into arguments or to air our grievances about anything. Number four, as Christian citizens, we can love our neighbor. We can love our neighbor. Regardless of the words or the actions of our government, we can show God's love to everyone. We can show kindness. We can build relationships with all kinds of people, whether they're different from us in color or country of origin or religion or orientation or education or economic status. We can love and serve refugees and unwed mothers and orphans and widows and the poor and the homeless. And rather than depending on the government to do those things or being angry when they don't, we can ask ourselves, what am I doing to love my neighbor? What am I doing to serve as a good citizen? Jesus teaches us, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus teaches us to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. We can love our neighbor. Number five, as Christian citizens, we can give the kingdom of God our highest allegiance. Jesus teaches us to do that, right? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And Paul wrote to the Philippians reminding them, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. God's kingdom, the church, is made up of all kinds of people, brought together into one body. We belong to each other because we belong to Christ. And we are not first Republicans or Democrats or conservatives or progressives. We're not first and foremost even citizens of the United States. Most importantly, we are the church of the resurrected and triumphant Lord Jesus Christ made up of people of all nations. And the church has survived everything from the rage of Nero to communist depression to Middle Eastern terrorist cells and the church will continue in spite of all the attacks of the evil one. We will pledge our allegiance to the flag but we will pledge a higher allegiance to the cross. And our railing cry is not hail to the chief, but Jesus is Lord. And regardless of what happens to America, we must seek first the kingdom of God. And finally, as Christian citizens, we can put our trust in God. Our, our trust shouldn't be in our country or in our president or in our, any elected representative. Our trust must be in God. Psalm 20 in verse 7, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 118.8, it is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. Psalm 27 in verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And then look again at the verses that Dave read for us a few minutes ago from our scripture reading. This is such a good psalm. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, 
the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the alien, sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Our God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He is everywhere. He is perfect. He is good. He is merciful. He is faithful. He is just. And in a world full of evil and trouble and chaos, God is our rock and our refuge. And if our trust is in the Lord, then we have nothing to fear. In 1820, Daniel Webster, former constitutional lawyer and U.S. Senator and Secretary of State, said this, whatever makes men good Christians makes them good citizens. I thought that was good. So as good Christians and good citizens, we must obey the law. We can pray. We should not argue, complain, judge, or condemn. We can love our neighbor. We can give the kingdom of God our highest allegiance. And we can put our trust in God. When we do those things, we are good citizens. We are good Christians. God is pleased. May God bless each of us as we walk with him.